Hi there, welcome to Ben's Astrophotography. Let's continue the most exciting topic in this hobby, choosing a telescope for astrophotography. This is part two. If you haven't watched the first part yet, please use the shortcut on the upper right corner to check it out. For amateur astronomers like us, buying a telescope is like buying a house. It will be the host of our curiosities, ambitions, explorations, and dreams. Last time we talked about focal length and focal ratio, so next, central obstruction. I would say reflector telescope and its inevitable central obstruction is the greatest improvement on telescope designs. It allows us to build huge telescopes with much lower cost. The biggest refractor in the world has an aperture of one meter only, while all the great telescopes of our age are reflectors, and they are much, much bigger. For amateurs, refractor versus reflector poses the same dilemma. Bigger aperture or better image quality? If you have a fixed budget, the best refractor you can get is more or less half the aperture of the best reflector you can get, which means the light gathering power is only one in four. The catch is, all reflectors have a central obstruction, meaning at the center of the aperture, there will always be a mirror to block part of the incoming light, which will cause more dispersion of starlight, and that means the contrast will be less than telescopes without central obstruction. If you are choosing among reflectors, a smaller central obstruction, say around 30% linear, will probably get pretty good stars for your image. The support for the secondary mirror which caused this central obstruction is also important. If it is held in place by a transparent lens, like in most schmidt cassegrain telescopes, there will be no spikes around the star. But if it's held by a spider, like in most Newtonians, RCs, CDKs, etc., you will see cross-shaped star spikes on your image. I personally find it quite beautiful, but there are plenty of people who just don't like it. The complexity of collimation is another point for consideration. Refractors are supposed to be totally good here, never need any collimation. Then schmidt cassegrain their collimation is quite easy, just play with three screws can get the job done. You can do collimation for schmidt cassegrains even under the stars. As for Newtonian, RC, and CDK, collimation is much more complicated. It's very much recommended to do it at home first. But I also heard from my friends using large refractors. They said being able to collimate the telescope might actually be a blessing for reflector owners. Because if a refractor goes out of collimation, either a quality issue or get bumped during transportation, the owner will never be able to fix that by themselves. They have to send it back to the factory. Last but not least, let's talk about image quality, cost, and weight. As soon as you start imaging, you will notice that stars on four corners of your image are not round. They can either be elongated, comet-shaped, or even like airplanes. This is caused by the curvature of your telescope's focal plane. Our camera sensors are flat, so when the telescope's focal plane is not flat, the corners of the camera sensor will slightly fall out of the focal plane. That's exactly what happened to the weird shaped stars on corners. Some telescopes have a flattener or corrector to improve the flatness of their focal plane. Most of them did, but there's a catch. Back focus. All reducer, flattener, or corrector have a preferred distance between its connection ring and the sensor. Sometimes it's quite sensitive, so you will have to make sure your optical train, like filter wheel, off-axis guider, adapters, and camera body, all of them add together will fit into this distance. The accuracy goes down all the way to 0.1 millimeter. Here's an example of the back focus chart for my William Optics GT81's corrector. See, 
it should be 54.8 mm from connection to focal plane. If you are looking for some high-end astrograph telescope like Takahashi, you can probably have a spot size diagram for your reference, like this. Check the rightmost star shape, normally that's what you will have on the corner of an image by full-frame cameras. For other telescopes, probably you will have to look for some uncropped subs on forums or you can go to astrobeam.com for completed photos. Here's my page on Astrobeam and welcome to take a look. Another spec for image quality is imaging circle or the size of telescope's focuser. Imaging circle means the area on the focal plane that's fully illuminated. If you use a CCD or CMOS chip that's bigger than the imaging circle, you will get dark corners on your image. 44mm imaging circle with a 2.5 inch focuser is good enough for a full frame camera. While some telescope has 66mm imaging circle with a 3 inch focuser, that seems a bit luxurious, but if you can afford that, the extra size of focuser will definitely give you more accuracy and stability. As for the most important concern, cost, the rule of thumb is very very simple. More expensive telescopes get you better image quality and a bigger imaging circle. No surprise here. I'm showing three processed pictures from all three telescopes I have owned. I used the exact same camera for all of them. Celestron's C6 is a good visual telescope, but its imaging potential is quite challenged, as you can see. GT81 with reducer is much better, but if you compare it with Takahashi Epsilon 180, it's not as close. Weight is also very important, because at the end of the day, with the increase of your income, money will no longer be a big problem, but our age and our back will certainly be. Plus, as your scope gets heavier, your mount's payload should match with it, which will get more expensive and heavy too. The good strategy might be, if you are young, get some heavy equipment as you can, longer focal lengths if you prefer. If you are not so young, I would suggest pick up a lighter telescope, like no more than 20 pounds, and go to gym more often. Let's wrap up. We talked about how to choose a telescope from four aspects. First is focal lens. It's more about which type of targets you want to shoot. Either galaxies, nebulae, or planets slash planetary nebulae. They all have their favorable range of focal lens. Also, your target decides where you can shoot. Second is focal ratio. The rule of thumb here, lower is better. And there's a max focal ratio for the pixel size on your camera. It should be no bigger than your camera's pixel size in microns multiplied by 1.5. The third is central obstruction. It reduces contrast and creates some complexities, like star spikes and uh, collimations. But telescopes with central obstruction can be much cheaper and lighter than refractors with the same aperture. All those great modern telescopes are reflectors too. Finally, cost and image quality of the scope goes hand in hand. Correctors and flatteners are our good friend, but we need to be careful with their back focus. Weight is a big concern too. My advice is to get something as heavy as you can handle. Do not overload your back. Thanks for watching. I hope now you have some good food for thought for your next telescope. Clear skies.